on your yes. screen and team, Tim, you could perhaps start sharing yours. Is that, uh, can people see it now? Did you share? Yes, yes. yes. Good. Okay, so I'll start setting my timer. Um, so uh, thanks very much to the organizers and, and welcome everyone in the online audience. Uh, I'd also like to say if anyone's watching this later on YouTube, uh, you're welcome to email questions uh, to the address here. And uh, I want to talk today about, um, uh, uh, we're going to continue the theme of division from the last talk, but in, in some sense move up to much larger length scales, talking about frog eggs dividing, which are a whole uh, millimeter in diameter, and focus particularly on the work of, of James uh, uh, Pelletier, who was, uh, I was lucky enough to recruit as an MIT physics student who uh, just uh, is finishing his uh, uh, PhD now. And let me uh, start by showing you a movie of frog eggs dividing. So I view this as a sort of icon of biology. And uh, these eggs, these are, are Xenopus slavis. They're about uh, 1.2 millimeters in diameter and they divide uh, every 30 minutes. And I'm showing here just as a sort of cartoon for illustrating it, the uh, positions of the nuclei imagined here. The, this is superimposed on the live movie we'd have to uh, fix the eggs and render them transparent to actually see the nuclei. And I'll focus particularly in the second half of the talk on one question connected to cleavage, which is how the nuclei move apart after mitosis. And the nuclei need to move apart to ensure that they end up in different cells and also to be in position for the next round of division. And sort of bigger picture, why are we interested in that kind of problem? Maybe we love frog eggs for their own sake but we also view them as an exemplar of, of cytoplasm in its more general properties. So we're very interested in the mechanical properties of cytoplasm. This is a completely imaginary spring and dash plot. I'm not actually gonna develop a model like that, but just to say that we think there will be some classical mechanics emerging here. How do these mechanics underlie biological organization and function? And then perhaps the central question in almost all biological physics is how do these macroscopic events, these mechanics emerge from the molecules in the system, which are of course much smaller. And two particularly important molecules here will be uh, tubulin and, and cytoplasmic dyne. So, what happened here? Okay, so uh, my whole career I've been working on microtubules. I was introduced to these in Mark Kirshner's lab as a PhD student. These are stiff rods uh, formed by polymerization of the protein tubulin, and they're very dynamic. They can grow and shrink on their free plus ends. They're, they're polarized polymers. And I also uh, uh, want to focus today on centrosomes to some extent, which are the, uh, uh, the, the nucleating centers that, that nucleate microtubules and generate radial arrays that are called asters. So I'll try and use the word centrosomes if I'm speaking of a real centrosome that has a pair of centrioles in the middle. Uh, and, and I'll use the word microtubule organizing center when we replace this with an artificial mimic, a, a plastic bead coated in nucleating material that I'll, I'll show you. And um, we've known for a long time that eggs and early embryos are organized by microtubule asters. This is an example of Martin Wurz's PhD work, an earlier student this is a frog egg embryo fixed after first cleavage, but before second cleavage. Uh, here in the orange color, you can see the centrosomes that nucleate uh, microtubules. And actually, I won't talk any more about nuclei. It's uh, suffice to know that the nuclei move to the centrosomes. So if we know how the centrosomes move, we know how the nuclei move as well. And then you'll notice that these asters are in two pairs. And the reason for that is uh, this pair here, uh, about five minutes prior to when this egg was fix fixed, it would have been a mitotic spindle, which is, has a naturally bipolar organization, and these are asters growing out from the poles of the spindle. And you can actually already see where the future second division furrow, it'll cut through the middle of the pair here. And we're sort of interested in how all this uh, gets organized. 
Um, I also, uh, in another important introductory point is that the growth of these asters in frog eggs is controlled by the cell cycle oscillator and the CDK1 kinase, the master kinase that turns on mitosis. So in mitosis, when the CDK1 is high, the asters are bounded. They don't get any longer than one microtubule, uh, which is about uh, 30 to 60 microns here, small compared to the egg. But when the egg goes into interphase, these asters can grow out, and I'll talk about how they grow out, and they have to grow out to span the egg in order to position the nuclei. And also, um, you can see here, this egg is, is not yet cleaving, but you can see it's setting up to cleave, and the cleavage furrow is gonna be positioned by the gap between these asters, where these, these are two dome-shaped asters seen here in a confocal section where this gap here touches the plasma membrane is where the cleavage furrow will come in. And um, we can't look live in frog eggs because they're opaque. Uh, I'll show you how we deal with that problem in a second, but uh, you can look live in fish eggs where the yolk is all segregated down to the bottom of the egg. And here's a beautiful movie taken by Martin Wuhr using a probe stuck to microtubules in fish eggs, showing the events right before uh, first mitosis through to cleavage and you can see these huge asters grow to fill the cells here. This is, I think, is one of the most beautiful movies taken in my lab over the years. So let it play one more time. So we're fascinated by how these asters grow and how they're positioned. So the three questions we've been grappling with for the last few, few years is, how do these asters, microtubule asters, grow to span the cell to get these giant dimensions? How do pairs of asters interact at the midplane of the cell? And how do the centrosomes at the center of the aster move and position in order to ultimately control the geometry of successive cleavage planes? And as I mentioned, the nuclei follow the centrosomes. And these actually, these three questions were the aims of a, an, an old grant proposal that we've been working on. I want to touch on each of them very briefly, but spend most of the time on the third one, which uh, James, uh, in particular, made recent progress. And uh, we can't look into frog eggs and do live movies, but uh, for many years we've been able to make a, a beautiful extract system by collecting the eggs, compacting them in a centrifuge tube, and then crushing them. We can get out this kind of 1x living cytoplasm, and here's a series of uh, uh, citations for that who people are interested. And in that cytoplasm, we think we can recapitulate most of the events uh, of early frog embryogenesis, including building uh, spindles and, and asters from a microtubule perspective. But this cytoplasm, you can see it's quite cloudy. It's full of organelles. It's also full of actin and other things I'll talk about in a minute. And the typical setup for an extract experiment is shown here. We, we build a chamber of two passivated cover slips spaced about 20 microns apart. We get our extract, we add fluorescent probes and either centrosomes or a, a, an artificial centrosome. We add calcium to trigger interphase to mimic fertilization, fill the chamber and, and start imaging. And here's actually quite an old movie um, at LOMAG just with a 10x objective. And you can see here asters growing and also I hope you can see that uh, they start rather clustered, uh, I think this is just random, and they're moving apart. And I'll come back to that moving apart uh, in a minute. So just quickly touch on the questions of how they grow so big, uh, because this was a very non-obvious, and this was the PhD work of a, a wonderful student, uh, Keske Ishihara, who's now working on tissue scale problems in, in Dresden and Vienna. But he addressed this uh, uh, mainly by uh, analyzing uh, uh, movies of asters growing, particularly in asters where instead of looking at the whole microtubule, we're looking at just the growing plus ends marked by a famous probe called uh, EB1GFP. And if, if you look at this movie, you'll see there's sort of two separate processes here. The aster periphery is expanding but the microtubules within it are growing somewhat faster, especially at the beginning of the movie. And what you can tell from this movie is that the aster is built up of a network of small microtubules. We estimate they're about uh, 15 microns long, which is, I don't know, roughly the diameter of the laser pointer. So it's a, it's a network of small, shorter microtubules that are, are cross-linked and it grows outwards by an autocatalytic 
autocatalytic nucleation process. We didn't figure out the molecular biology of it, but Cascade built a, a model we were rather satisfied with in the mathematical model in the eLife paper. Now, we also care about how pairs of asters interact because that keeps them separate and also specifies where the cleavage furrow comes in. And uh, Annie Nguyen and Christine Field and other people in the lab uh, uh, make progress on this problem by realizing that this pair of asters here is equivalent to a cytokinesis in a smaller cell and look for signaling complexes uh, that orchestrate cytokinesis in smaller cells. And there's two particularly important conserved complexes, the chromosome passenger complex with the Aurora B kinase in it and the central spindling complex. And you can see here they're recruited to a plane. So this is a plane cut in cross section where the two asters meet. And this plane has, has really two activities. It stops the microtubules from crossing into each other. And when it touches the plasma membrane, it will uh, trigger the cleavage furrow. And I, we published quite a bit on that. I'm not going to talk about that in uh, much more detail. Um, but we're able to also uh, uh, see that recruitment of, of signaling complexes in our extract system. And I'll show you a movie here. If you start by focusing on the right hand side here, you can see the microtubule asters growing. And once they touch each other, they recruit this uh, uh, red signaling complex, the chromosome passenger complex, to make these uh, lines now, because we're looking at a quasi two dimensional system. And then uh, what Christine Field noticed is that where this signaling complex is recruited, it actually causes a disassembly of the actin network. The, the whole cytoplasm is filled with actin filaments, but where the kinase is recruited or the kinase complex, uh, the, the actin disassembles. And uh, in this paper here, uh, uh, she also showed that where the actin disassembles, the cytoplasm is softer. You can see, for example, hydrodynamic flow occurs preferably along the red lines and not through the asters. So there's a local softening uh, in between the asters that I'll come back to. I have to go outside and then down. Okay, and now I want to move to um, how the asters move in position, or particularly the centrosomes at their center. And in eggs, it looks like this. This is sort of a recapitulation. So here's at mitosis, here's uh, 15 minutes later, the centrosomes have moved apart. They've also split in two pairs here, and that splitting occurs with a characteristic angle that we're fascinated by, and that's the next thing we're going to work on. We don't know much about that yet. But the aster periphery here, so this movement outwards of the periphery is a combination of polymerization and translocation. It has about 20 microns a minute, whereas the centrosomes, it's translocation only, and it's about a third of that rate. And we're particularly interested right now in this process. Um, and what we know through a lot of work by a number of labs, in, including ours, but not, not, not majorly ours, uh, this is uh, Martin Wurz's PhD work from 2010, is that the movement of centrosomes is mostly caused by uh, the dynein motor pulling on microtubules. And the kind of cartoon version that's extant in the field is shown here, or as if you imagine an aster microtubule growing outwards from the center, the centrosome here, and dynein moving inwards, because it moves towards the minus end, which are clustered here. The act of the dynein moving inwards would generate a force on the microtubules outwards. And this way of cartooning the model was first proposed actually by uh, Hiramoto back in 1986, looking in uh, sea urchin eggs. And I'm calling that the force per unit length model. The dynein uh, uh, moves all the way down the microtubules. And so the force scales with the microtubule length and the chromosome moves towards longer microtubules. And I think you can see how in a closed system, this would lead to a centering force, which is why the field found that model so appealing. And uh, almost everyone is uh, proposing that kind of model. Uh, and in 2010, when we were looking at the centrosomes moving out for the first time, we proposed that because the microtubules are longer on this side than this side, that's why the centrosomes move in that direction. Although we didn't have direct evidence for that. Um, on the basis of James's work, I'm, we're going to propose a different model, and, and this will be confusing at first, but let me just state it for you, and then I'll tell you why we came to this idea. 
And the key element, of this is a force per unit surface area. Key to this model is the dynein is only active on the very outside of the aster. It, it's not active internally. That creates a force on the outside. And then we think the directionality comes from a deformation because the inside is softer. So this force is transmitted through the aster and then the de deformation is controlled by where the system is soft. So a very different way of, of thinking about it. But looking at both these models, of course, there are many questions. Is, is this dynein free? Is it just by itself or is it anchored to something? Dynein normally transports uh, organelles, so that would be an obvious candidate. What is it anchored to? Where does it move? Does it move throughout, as shown here? And also, what else is in the cytoplasm? All these models draw dynein and microtubules, but we know that cytoplasm is more complicated. And to touch on that last question first, I uh, want to emphasize, and this is very much what James brought in his PhD, was looking at all the networks or a number of networks in the cytoplasm. And, and all cytoplasm, including frog egg cytoplasm, contains a, a number of entangled networks, microtubules, uh, which we think have the long distance organization in this system, endoplasmic reticulum, which is a tubular network primarily, and then F-actin, which is the filament system. There's also a small number of keratin filaments that are kind of similar to the actin that I'm not showing. And in this movie, the microtubules are growing. This is a 60X confocal movie. The, you can actually see the actin becomes somehow entrained to the microtubules. We don't know how that happens. The ER is busy moving in and out. But actually, if you look at this movie, you'll see there isn't that much net transport. On average, it stays uh, uh, fairly spread out, and that'll become important later. So if we um, move back to low mag, and we like low magnification because then we can sort of measure transport phenomena uh, on more on the scale of the egg itself. So here are the same probes now shown at 20x, and this is a deliberately chosen field just where randomly a bunch of microtubule organizing centers were clustered at an early time point, and they're going to move apart, and the movie will loop. So you can see if you first look at the microtubules, they're gradually moving apart as the asters grow initially slowly and then more rapidly. While they're moving apart, the actin is disassembling or, or its assembly is being blocked in between the asters and the ER is, is moving on the microtubules. And so this movement is, you always see this movement. We wanted to know what generates the force, what determines the direction of movement. And also, do the aster microtubules move through these other components or do, do they move with them? And you can sort of get a sense of that from the movies, but you need to analyze uh, uh, to be more careful. And I don't want to spend, this is a very complicated experiment in design and analysis, but this is, inhibiting different motor systems. This is taking a random field and measuring movement that causes the, the microtubule organizing centers basically to go from random spacing to more uniform spacing is what we see in this bulk system where we don't have edges. And James used a Delaunay triangulation to connect nearest neighbors and then look at evolution of the times. And if you look at the peak velocities here, you see this characteristic plot with a, a sort of correlation line like this. So if they start closer together, they move apart. That's the a positive velocity. If they start further apart, they move together, but we think that's just a consequence of the moving apart. What matters here is if you inhibit dynein and actomyosin, if you fragment actin and inhibit dynein, almost all the movement goes away. If you block just just the microtubule motor, you lose some of the movement. If you block just the actomyosin motor, you lose some of the movement. So the two motor systems seem to collaborate in this 2D system to move the organizing centers. And then do they move together or separately? And the answer is they all move together. Here's a, a velocity map of microtubules, ER and actin plotted along a line connecting two centers. And the main take home here is if you look at the colors, which color code velocity um, and colors flip around the midpoint, you can see that uh, the microtubules, the ER and the F-actin are all moving in the same direction at the same rate, more or less everywhere. So 
the aster is moving as a continuum here. At this type of analysis, we see very little relative movement. Um, now, what is the dienine anchored to? And we can find that out. We, we see organelles move best if we fragment the actins. I'm first going to show you a movie with actin fragmented, looking at endoplasmic reticulum mitochondria. And if you watch this movie, as the microtubules grow out, I hope you can see the ER moving in. And then if you look here at mitochondria, you'll also see the mitochondria moving in. Although you'll notice it doesn't, it sort of moves in at the edge and then slows down. So basically all the organelles move in and this motion is blocked by a dynein inhibitor. So we actually think the dynein is anchored to all the organelles. And if you look at the same experiment with the actin intact, the organelle motion is much less pronounced. And it's actually a little difficult to see what's going on here. You can see this sort of dark band move, but it's a little difficult to see what's going on in terms of movement. So you have to analyze it. And James developed a series of analysis. What the plot that's shown here is a mass transport analysis where he drew concentric circles and measured fluorescence coming in and leaving the circles, applying a mass balance, um, you know, conservation of mass. Criterion. And what you can see here is that red here shows a, a, a peak in mass transport. This is the aster surface. So right near the surface, there's inward transport. But if you look much deeper in the aster, there's really no transport. Um, so Tim, the transport is at the edge. Thank you. I'm almost done here. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't intend to do that. And so just to end here with our model, so we see inward movement at the aster surface. Because organelle movement is restricted to the surface, we're proposing that dynein pulling forces are restricted to the surface. In the middle, everything's moving together. And since there's no relative movement, we think there can't be movement force or net force uh, on the microtubules from dynein. And then we think this whole gel moves outwards because it's softer in the middle, because the kinase in the middle here is, is melting the cytoskeleton, or well, sorry, disassembling it. Melting is probably an incorrect word. Um, and then let me just finally end here by saying, is, is this general? Um, we think some of the lessons may be general, but we think the details may be very system dependent. And in particular, there may be some change in systems according to size. For example, a lot of work's been done on the C. elegans egg, which is a reasonably large cell, but it's tiny compared to a frog egg. And if you look at this surface zone where relative movement occurs, it's a small fraction of the radius of a frog egg aster, but it's the entire radius of a cell. And so we think the system can really be somewhat different uh, in C. elegant eggs where single microtubules span the whole distance. So a lot still to do here. And let me just end by thanking my group. This is a kind of image I'm sure we're all familiar with here. Uh, a, a, a group meeting in times of COVID, uh, particularly emphasized James uh, Pelletier and Christine Field, uh, who did. Uh, most of the work here. And good, that's where I end. Sorry, it's going to ring. There you go. <clears throat> well, thank you, Tim, for a wonderful well talk. That's the kitchen timer. It won't shut oh. up. Anyway, uh, ha there's a few minutes here. Happy to answer uh, questions or, or, or more on, on, on the email. Yeah, so what I will do is I'm going to read out some of the questions that have been written in the chat box and Tim, you could answer them. And then, you know, in the next 15 minutes, we can take more questions and we will also send you uh, the questions that you don't have a time, to, uh, don't have a chance to answer right now. That's good. Although in the 15 minutes, we should, you know, have both speakers. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, both sure both we, yeah. so that's the plan. Basically, both yes. anyway, good. <clears throat> Okay, so I guess the first question I wanted to ask is from Behezad uh, Golshoyal, and uh, the question is, if we bend microtubule, shall yeah. we expect, so if you, if you bend a microtubule, yeah. shall you expect the molecular motor to go to the place where the force is maximum? Um, yeah, an interesting question. We really haven't dealt with bending, although if you look at the, the one live movie of these big asters, you'll actually see that the microtubules at the periphery are very bent. And in the extract system, we know that, if I just play this movie again, it works. Oops, I'll go back one more. <clears throat> 
So if you look at the aster periphery, they're initially straight, but as the asters grow, they get very bent at the periphery. We think that bending is caused by cytoplasmic dynein. We know in the extract system that if we inhibit dynein, the asters get a lot more straight. So there's certainly a connection between motor proteins and bending. So far to the very limited extent we've looked at it, the causality is the opposite of proposed by the questioner. That is, we think the motors cause the bending, but we haven't looked where the motors are and certainly particularly if you have sharp bends in a microtubule, it, it is documented that um, um, things will move to the bent region, particularly if it's sort of bent on the molecular scale. So it's a really, bending is a really interesting question that we haven't really addressed. Okay, the next question is from Meredith Betterton and she asks, do you think there is any direct molecular links between the microtubule and the actin networks that hold them together? Or do you think they move together primarily because they are entangled? Yeah, it's a really good question. And honestly, we don't know. They're not just entangled. You can see that the actin that sort of initially, as far as we can tell, isotropic, becomes kind of entrained to the microtubules as the microtubules grow. So there is some tendency to co-align. And I think if it was just entanglement, that would not occur. So I think there must, I think, but I don't know, it could just be due to forces, I suppose. But you know, I suspect that there are some molecular entanglements. Um, and you know, there are a number of molecular candidates in that literature. Quite a few proteins have been implicated in, in physically connecting either directly or indirectly via organelles. So I think it's a really interesting question, uh, but other than just there is some co-alignment, we don't have any direct evidence. We would like to look, I think, at the role of myosin fives. Those are often very important for overall positioning of organelles. A lot of organelles have myosin-5 on them as well as kinesins and dynein. So it would, in other systems that people have looked at, that would be a productive, uh, uh, potentially molecular uh, player to look at. And there's plenty of myosin-5 in the egg cytoplasm. Uh, very little known about it. Okay, uh, so the next, I wanted to ask a related question from Christoph Schmidt, and he's asking, is there collective fluid motion as well, or are the networks being dragged through the viscous fluid background? Hi, Christoph. Uh, great question. Um, when the asters move rapidly, we have another system for making them move where they move about five times as fast. Under those circumstances, we actually made some measurements of soluble components. We used a cage fluorescein as a probe, and we determined that uh, fluorescein is advected with the moving asters. So when they move rapidly, they advect the liquid component with cytoplasm with them. If that's true, then they must be generating hydrodynamic forces. Uh, we have some evidence for the kind of motion I showed, which we think is, is closer to how they move in eggs, that that motion is also fast enough to drive, to generate hydrodynamic forces that cause flows outside the, a and, and perhaps vortex flows to the inside. Actually, in this model here, you need continuous polymerization in the middle, so you need a continuous supply of subunits. So you could imagine flow going around the outside and into the middle. Uh, live imaging will be essential for that. Um, and we're actually worried about the dimensionality of, you know, our quasi 2D system may not model that well in a 3D egg. Because in our, in our quasi 2D system, the surfaces of the glass are very dominant and they generate a, a frictional drag that's not present in the egg. So, we think we're gonna to have to increase the distance between the cut glass cover slips a lot, which means changing our microscopy, but it's, it's an exciting area. And I think a number of students of the sort of physical embryology of early embryos are getting really interested in these hydrodynamic forces. Um, uh, Stefan Detalia's group, I know is very, we were actually inspired by their work on 
moving actomyosin advecting cytosol, which I think was a, a brilliant observation. So fantastic question needs to be asked in all these systems. All right, we so, have some, yeah, sorry. We have more questions, but I thought maybe we can move to the 15 minute discussion time and we can take these questions during that time, both yes. for you and for Suliana, the questions that we didn't get a chance to uh, discuss. Did I manage to stop sharing there? Yes, it looks like yes. it. Looks yes, you did. Okay, so now the, the floor is, is, is open. <clears throat> yeah, now I think you guys can also even unmute yourselves and you know, you can ask your questions in person.